What's in the box? What's in the fucking box? All right, welcome everybody to the next What's in the Box. Today we're going to be talking about the Warhog. Now I've got a special treat here today. I don't just have one Warhog, I have a pair of Warhogs. Uh, because um, we're starting our Journeyman League, we actually uh, get to start a new faction here in Ottawa. And the faction that I've decided to go with is uh, Minions. Uh, now, the, uh, the Minions pact that I've decided to go with is Pharaoh, and specifically Dr. Arcadius. If you'd like to see more about Dr. Arcadius, his spells, his stats, um, and uh, what his model looks like, uh, you can go back one in the um, YouTube, or if you've just joined us on the stream, unfortunately you're going to have to wait for the YouTube video to come out because I'm not going to go back and do it all again. So in front of us we have a couple of Warhogs. Now there is one big difference you'll see in these two kits. Uh, one of them says the plastic miniatures kit and the other does not. That's because these two Warhogs were produced at very different times. Um, one thing that I will show uh, is the uh, PIP numbers. Now, Privateer Press, whenever they release a model, uh, let's see if I can actually get them on screen, there we go, um, produce a uh, PIP number that is unique to that model. If you notice, they, um, they are actually different models. We've got uh, 75029 and 75047, um, the plastic and uh, metal separately. So what we're going to do is we're going to open these guys up, we're going to have a look at the models themselves, we're going to have a look at the difference between the plastic and the metal, and uh, we'll take a quick look at the stat cards because, well, they're the same beast. So, first thing we're going to do is pull out uh, the uh, uh, metal guy. He is the older, shall we say, the original model. Now, when you are, uh, when you get a metal uh, boxed miniature from Privateer Press, it will come in uh, what we call the large clamshell. Large clamshell, we got it out here. Uh, the large clamshell is what you used to find battle boxes in. Um, it's what you'll still find any of their large uh, metal kits in. The um, large clamshell you'll find basically for anything that would tear a blister in half. So you also get um, the stat card, which um, in the large blister box is just going to be sitting in the side. So don't throw out your box until you get this card. Uh, that has happened to me too many times to count. Um, and we're left with this awesome box of heavy metal. So let's open this bad boy up and see what we've got inside. Now, this is the first time I've actually opened this box, so we'll have to do a quick inventory of what we've got. Uh, this seems to be a very large torso. Get that guy out. Some tusks. A gigantic axe. Mechanical leg. Some sort of tiny plug. Um, the head. This seems to be a stack, I believe. Um, the st standard Privateer Press large base. It seems to be a Gen 3 base, in case anybody cares. Um, the mechanical other hand. Uh, very interesting. This seems to be a, um, a hand stolen from a Kadoran Warjack. I would guess a Juggernaut, because that looks like a standard Juggernaut pattern. Um, we have the lower legs. We have another smokestack, little piggy tail, uh, I'm going to bet that's a crotch cape, another small smokestack, and it looks like the upper part of the arm. Uh, nothing left in there but sprue. Something I talked about on our last video, if you have seen it, is um, sprue or mold lines. Now, on the Dr. Arcadius model, I didn't show any mold lines because there weren't any that were really good, uh, really good places to show it. On a beast of this size, we're going to get a lot of places to show it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a nice big zoom in. That's too far, too far. 
there we go. Um, and this will really allow us to see the horribleness that is a mold line. Mold lines can ruin yours and everybody else's day because if they're not handled, they will play merry havoc with your paint job and cause you nothing but problems. So on a piece like this, you're going to get a couple of different things. You're going to get these little tiny tabs. Let's just bend this guy up here so we can see him better. Um, and this little tab here is a relic of the mold process. So when they make these molds, uh, the molds are generally two pieces. Um, the molds, when they go together, will have uh, along the seam where those two places are uh, vents that will allow air out and uh, places where metal runs in. Um, and the vents or the um, places where metal runs in will generate these little, these little sprues that you have to remove when you're uh, making the model. Uh, and then the, oh, let's just flip it all over the place. And then usually in the same line as the sprue, you can see it running along here, is uh, what we call a mold line. Let's see if I can get that more centered on the camera for you guys. So again, here's that mold line. And you have to remove that mold line if you, if you want to get a good paint job on these minis. Now, some of the best uh, people I have ever played against have uh, fielded what I call silver armies. But um, most people can't do that because it is a well-known fact that um, painted models actually roll better than um, unpainted armies. So let's take a little bit closer look at some of these parts. Um, Take a look at this giant face first. Look at this guy. The Roadhog is an impressive monster. That's straight on. Let's see if we can give you a little bit of a profile shot here. Hold them up a bit. I will really have to get better at positioning so that you guys can see him. Uh, he's, he's a really nasty beastie uh, with those two giant axes. Um, and with this, <laughs> with this model, um, you have not only this gigantic snarling face, but these guys that you have to worry about. These are the two great big axes, the mechanical Kadoran style axe. And the slightly less mechanical sort of cleaver style axe. Now, um, looking at the, the main body here, um, we've got this interesting location that has a hole for it, and it looks like um, a plug goes in this hole. Now, I did notice earlier this tiny little beastie. So one thing you really have to worry about when you're unpacking models is that something like this does not get lost. In a later episode, we'll be looking at Syntharian, and the plastic Syntharian has a thousand tiny, tiny pieces. Um, and he uh, will cause you no end of grief if you lose just one of them. In fact, uh, the plastic Syntharian I have may actually be missing one of those tiny, tiny pieces. This, uh, this seems to be a heart plug or some other tiny doodad. Just see if I can angle it a bit so you can see the detail on him. And that seems to drop into this hole on the front of the War Beast. And then, of course, we take that guy and we put a giant head on him. And you can see how the assembly is going to go. This War Beast isn't uh, particularly posable, but that is a great thing for someone who is starting out because it means that you're not going to have a lot of extra... Uh, things to worry about because all of the bits are just going to line up in one position you'll uh, be able to uh, put him together quite easily now uh, one thing that I will do is I'll show you the rest of the bits here so we've had a good look at that one smokestack the head and the torso and the chest plate here's the tusks Take a look here, they're, uh, they're quite nice. 
uh, we've got the little banding on one side there. Um, here we have one of the two arms. And because this is Dr. Arcadius's, you can see the really great uh, mechanical and biological thing that he has going on. Uh, here is the more mechanical of the little piggy legs. Make sure to get him in frame for you. Um, here is the Kadoran upper arm. Uh, it really looks like a juggernaut arm, um, except for the shoulder or the elbow piece here. And then the gigantic Kadoran um, fist carrying a meat cleaver. It looks like maybe they've welded this meat cleaver together out of a couple of pieces. Here is his uh, lower torso. He's kind of a hard piece to get a look at. Let's see if we can get him more sort of in the in the way that you would see him with that front leg forward. If you notice that it has a very large flat area here on the front, you'll find this on a lot of large infantry and war jacks uh, because they will have a second piece, uh, a, um, a crotch flap of some variety, whether it be something like this piece, which is a flowing metal cape, or um, sometimes on some of the Kadoran jacks, it is merely a, um, uh, a metal plate. Uh, but it is really hard to do something that they call undercuts when you're building a model. So if you look at these two pieces, um, if we were to uh, try and cast these both as one large piece, you'd have this large area underneath, uh, underneath this front flap and um, in behind these legs. And that would either fill up with material, costing a lot more, or it would be almost impossible to get your mold out and it would break the mold. So they will often cut these front flaps off. Uh, that also does give you one really great thing that when you are painting uh, a piece like this, you'll be able to get at stuff like this back leg and uh, the uh, thigh area here that once this flap is in place are gonna be really hard to get at. So I'll just give you a shot of the back of him. You got some nice big plating here and the, um, and this uh, rope that goes across. And let's see what we've got left. We have a tail. Most of the piggies here have nice big tails and a uh, one last little smokestack. So I'm going to pull him off. Uh, we do have the standard large base as the camera goes insane trying to figure out what the heck I've just put in front of it. This is a um, third generation privateer press base. Um, you can tell by the um, textured inner surface. And on the back side, you'll see uh, not only a uh, slot and some uh, little spikes, but you'll also see Privateer Press engraved on the bottom. Now, you might ask yourself, why are there these little reinforced spikes on the bottom? Well, that's because quite a few models have um, mounting spikes on their feet. So let's get this uh, little guy over here. We'll just move everybody over. Um, you will see on the bottom of his foot this mounting spike. Um, one of the really good ways to secure your model is actually to take your hobby knife or a small drill and drill out the inside of this through the top of the base. And then you can put that spike into that um, hole. And because it's not moving through just this thin material of the base itself, it will give it a, lo a lot more sturdy purchase on the base. Um, now, you wouldn't want to do that if you were doing something like a cork base or something that's going to elevate it, but um, it actually uh, will, when you're putting together especially a metal miniature, it gives it a lot more strength. Um, 
several of my Metal Legion models would not be standing today if they did not have their uh, pins through the base. So that's the Metal Warthog, War, yeah, Warhog. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out a bit so that we can get an overview again. And we're going to take a look at what's in the plastic war Warhog uh, kit. So I'm going to move all these guys off to the side. And let's open the plastic box. So the only difference on this box when you're looking at them on this at the store is uh, the fact that it will say plastic miniature kit along the bottom. And as I mentioned before, the PIP number on the top will be different. So if you're looking to get the plastic version or the metal version, you really have to um, take a second, take a look and see what they've got. So let's open this up. Now, if you have opened a battle box before, which most people have, you'll recognize this little tray. Um, this plastic tray uh, is what they've started using anytime you have a plastic kit. Um, uh, this tray has a couple of big advantages for plastics over the clamshell in that it's significantly cheaper to produce. Unfortunately, it makes it also a lot less useful um, to us as modelers because it's nowhere near as sturdy and it doesn't hold shut. Um, but what it does do is quite nicely capture the card at the bottom. Um, that way you don't have that problem where you throw away your cards for your model. So I'm just going to pull that out of the way because we already have one of these cards. We'll take a look at that in just a second. And here is our kit for the plastic uh, Warhog. Now, it probably looks a little bit smaller uh, to you because all the pieces are jumbled up on top of each other. But most of the time, when they go from a uh, metal kit to a plastic kit, they actually get slightly bigger. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open this up and then we'll be able to take a look at all the pieces and do a quick comparison, any differences and uh, what the plastic versus the metal look like. So here is our giant bag of metal or plastic parts. So again, as I've just gone over third generation uh, privateer press base, get that out of the way. Here is our same uh, Warhog body. Uh, looks very similar to the last one. Now, in just a second, I'm going to zoom in and show you some of the little differences that happen when you move from plastic to metal, or from metal to plastic. But uh, for right now, we'll just do the gross anatomy of this beastie. So we also have the arms. So this one has um, the hand and forearm integrated. Um, this one is just the forearm. Uh, we have one of our smokestacks. Uh, again, there's our favorite crotch flap. Here's our imposing war beast head. The second arm, the more Kadoran one of them, with the big old cleaver. Again, our tusks, uh, the single foot. Now, if you'll notice, this is the, uh, shall we say, meat foot. Um, I'll show that close up in just a second. And it's different from the uh, metal one in that that meat foot was actually part of the lower body, which is what we have here. We have the tail. Now, this is a... This is an example of a sprued model. We have the tail and we actually have the heart plug on this model um, that uh, is still on the sprue. And the reason they leave it on the sprue is so that you can't lose that tiny little heart plug, just like the metal one. Uh, what I was talking about with being very careful not to lose them. Uh, we have here, uh, strangely, what appears to be a Warjack head. I will have to look at... Um, the doodads hanging from the uh, Warhog's belt to see where that lives. Apparently, we lucked out and got a second tail assembly. So that will go in my bits box and I'll have an extra heart plug and an extra tail to play with. Uh, we have a another one of the smokestacks. 
the mechanical leg. Uh, and last but not least, this seems to be the shoulder pad that's trying to get away from me. I have to actually use my hands. So there's all the plastic bits. Now, um, let's, uh, I'm going to zoom in and we'll take a look at some differences between the plastics and the metals. Privateer Press has been doing plastics for a little while now. Um, they don't do their plastics in-house. Unlike their metals, which are um, all cast in-house as far as I know, um, their plastics are actually shipped from overseas, which means that sometimes you get a little bit lower build quality on them. Uh, the metals I've always found to be superlative. The plastics sometimes can have some problems. Um, but it also means usually a less expensive product. Um, but when you're changing from a metal mold to a plastic mold, they, they've been able to do a bunch of things um, to sort of make our lives easier. Um, we've got someone on the chat mentioning that a lot of the heavy warjack sculpts, they've actually done a massive size increase. This has made things like the... Um, the old and new Slayers look completely different sizes. The ironclad, if you see a metal ironclad and a plastic ironclad next to each other, the plastic ironclad looks kind of wimpy. Uh, it's even more obvious in the Signarin uh, Charger how different they look. So now that we're nice and zoomed in, let's uh, get us a metal torso and a plastic torso next to each other. And we can look at a couple of the differences going the wrong way. So um, perhaps the first thing you'll notice is that the hole here where the heart plug goes in is round and devoid of any ornamentation, whereas the plastic place where the heart plug goes, you'll notice it has a weird pattern inside it. So what I'll do is I'll just tilt this guy up so you can really see it. That pattern um, means that the heart plug can actually only go in one way. Now, you might ask, well, why would you want that? Uh, with the old style, you could have it oriented any direction. With the new style, it has to be oriented one way. Um, on something like this heart plug, it's not a big deal. But on something like um, the place where the uh, actual torso connects, you can see how the shape, oh, I'm doing it again. You can see how the shape has caused it, uh, causes them to really be able to set where the model goes together, making it even easier. And the other big thing is that there tends to be a lot less gaps. Um, now, uh, a plastic model will often hold together without any glue. Not that you should not glue your models, but it is a great way to dry fit. Um, even inside here where we have this stitched area, uh, you can see that inside the stitched area, we've got, again, another pattern that means that it can't go in wrong. If we look at this uh, metal one, we have that same stitched pattern, and it's going to uh, stop it from rotating, but we can still orient it incorrectly. Uh, if we flip the Warhogs up onto their fronts here, we can also see another difference. Uh, Again, we need to orient ourselves a little bit better so you guys can see well. Uh, you'll notice that on the metal, uh, because of where they had to make the cut to be able to put on the um, head, they've had to model part of that uh, crest of hair onto the back part of the model. Whereas on the plastic, because um, the head can be recessed in, they've been able to do all of that on the, uh, all of that uh, big old crest on the head. And this again allows you for a much better fit. So instead of just having this small circular area on the front for gluing or modeling, you actually have uh, this, whole, uh, this whole area here around the edges plus this upper edge. And since the head will actually seat into this cavity, Unlike on the metal, where it actually just connects around the outside, it will seat back into this cavity and give you a much better bond, and you'll have a lot uh, less problems when you're going to move around the model. And of course, the first time you drop it, because we are all going to drop our models. It just happens. 
or you know somebody else comes along and does it for us. So let's take a look at a couple of the other pieces that have really changed. Uh, one of the pieces that's really changed is uh, this lower um, legs. So the, the lower, lower torso and leg assembly has had uh, quite a work over. You can see that we still have the, the two legs, we still have the back flaps on both of them. But of course, the big thing that's missing is uh, on the plastic one, we don't have the meat leg here. And that's why in the plastics, we have, uh, we have the extra meat leg. And just like for the others, um, we have that same keying into the, in this hole here. Um, we've just had a comment on the uh, stream about Angeli, um, or the Angelius. Uh, it will fall over at the drop of a hat because Privateer Press decided that the center of mass of that model should be about six inches up the model. Um, it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, but it's a great model and an amazing model in combat. Um, so with this, with this guy, uh, we actually have more assembly to do, but because of that keying, it's going to be a much more um, solid connection. Uh, even with the uh, crotch flap, on this guy, you notice this, <laughs> he's, he's smooth like a Ken doll here, which means that even though we've got a large surface area, it's not going to connect really well. On the plastic one, we've got a gigantic hole here that's keyed so that when we push that crotch flap in, um, it's going to stay really well uh, connected. Uh, the other big place that we saw a difference was in the arms. With the uh, metal arms, uh, we have a multi-part, uh, I guess it's his right arm. So we have the hand and the arm. The uh, hand is in a ball socket. Let's just move this up so you guys can see it better. Uh, the hand is a ball socket um, and the arm uh, where you can connect it to the arm. With the plastic, um, it's all one piece. Now, this is going to be a significantly stronger structure because anywhere you have a ball socket, if those two pieces aren't perfectly smoothed out um, and then super glued real tight and maybe pinned, that hand is just gonna drop off. I have had my Prime Axiom's right arm drop off no less than six times now um, before it got really heavily pinned and it is because of that connection. Now, be aware if you are buying the new retail versions of the uh, Kondoran Extreme Destroyer and Juggernaut, they're going to have this construction basically everywhere on the model. Um, because they have um, this ball and socket construction, it means you can really have a great posing, but it does mean that um, it's going to be a lot more difficult to hold them together. And my Extreme Juggernaut, unlike the new ones, is all metal and will fall apart again when you look at it funny. Uh, let's just move those guys out of the way. Most of the other parts are going to be very similar. Um, the, the little extras are going to be different though. Because we have, uh, because we have a uh, extra Kadoran um, jack head that, that will add on to the, I believe it's the leg, yep, uh, that goes onto the upper leg. You can see its connecting point there. You can see where the jack head sits. Um, and we've got the elbow joint that actually used to be part of, um, I believe the, I believe the metal arm. Uh, we actually have a few extra pieces in the plastic, um, but I think the ability to have the model hold together really well uh, will actually be a benefit to us. Uh, one thing about plastic models that I haven't mentioned, and I'll just put some um, giant screaming heads on the uh, screen so you guys can take a look at them. Um, one thing about plastics is just like I was talking about for metals, um, when they are cast, they spray the inside of uh, the mold with a material that stops uh, 
metal from sticking to things or in this case, plastic from sticking to things. The real big problem with that is if you do not wash your miniatures, um, it stops paint from sticking to things because it's a thing that sticks to either paint, uh, to metal or plastic. Um, I have heard of people that don't um, wash their miniatures and they seem to do okay, but it's a little five minute step that can save you a lot of pain later, especially if you're using thin, thin paints, um, like if you're airbrushing or if you're even just painting with your paints at the thinness that they should be, uh, you're going to end up um, where your paint just uh, either runs off or it doesn't stick at all. And that can be a real big problem. Um, so let's uh, take these guys out of there for a second and we'll take a quick look at the gun bore. It's card. So here we are, uh, sorry, not gun bore, the Warhog's card. So here we have our nice friend, the Warhog. Um, like almost all um, uh, beasts, feral beasts, he's slow, but he hits relatively hard. Um, we've just actually had a uh, question in the chat about what to wash them with since I mentioned that. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we've had recommendations for uh, Simple Green. Simple Green is really great because it will not only take off the, um, the mold release, but it will also actually take off paint. So if, you are, um, if you're getting a model, uh, Simple Green can actually take the paint off. Um, I just use warm water and a, a warm soapy water and a toothbrush and then make sure that you rinse it because no matter how hard you scrub, if you don't actually wash that stuff away, it's going to stick. Uh, someone's recommending an electric toothbrush and I will also uh, put my arm up to that being a really good idea because it will be able to get down in little holes that you will have to really scrub at. So um, back to his card, um, he's a slow beast uh, with a regular high strength and mat, um, and he has a nice big cleaver. So you're going to get um, both uh, big heavy attacks with his war cleavers. Um, they're both PS16 and a gore with those big old tusks uh, for 15. He is a Fury 4 war beast, so you can put uh, four Fury on him and a threshold of eight. So that means when there's four Fury on him, you uh, have to roll a four. Uh, well, you have to roll over a four before he goes nuts. Um, if we take a quick look at the back, um, unlike a uh, Warcaster who only has access to the spells on their card, a Warlock has access to a thing called the Animus. And the, each War Beast actually has an Animus that um, can be cast by the Warcaster or cast by the beast himself. In this case, his animus is Massacre. It's a two cost animus, um, which a lot of them are. Um, the target friendly model can charge without being uh, forced. When the affected model destroys an enemy model with a charge attack, after the attack is resolved, it can advance up to one inch and make an additional melee attack. Massacre lasts for one turn. Uh, this means that if you can get this guy nicely buffed up and fire him into a, a group of low uh, defense infantry, as long as he keeps hitting and killing, he can just cut a swath through. It's what you'll often hear someone refer to as pack manning through a unit, um, where he just gobbles up the unit. It's something that Madrak lives for. Um, he also, the Warhog also has this thing called an aggression dial. This model can be forced during its activation, so it can use one of the four fury that can be allocated. Uh, to gain plus two strength for one turn, but he suffers D3 damage points. This is one of the places where uh, pairing a Warhog with Dr. Arcadius uh, really pays off because once you have taken the damage, you can do psy psychosurgery with Dr. Arcadius and heal him back up. And uh, the last thing is his tux tusks have critical knockdown. So when you roll two numbers the same and it is a hit, uh, on your dice, then you get a critical hit and that model is knocked down, which means after it's knocked down, all of your melee attacks are going to automatically hit and your defense in range is going to go down to five. So that is the Warhog. That's the plastic Warhog. And that's the metal Warhog. So uh, that's going to do it for today on What's in the Box. Thanks a lot, guys.